Well, I'm, my name is Craig Lindsay. I was, uh, by default, uh, became the president of the Western Mining Alliance. And uh, we'll go over tonight who we are. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two speakers, guest speakers tonight. Ray Nutting, who's a District 2 El Dorado County Supervisor, fourth generation. And um, Kirk McKenzie, who uh, founded uh, Defend Rural America. And he's going to speak tonight about mining and land rights and uh, a bunch of other is uh, issues that I think you'll be very, very interested in. I'd also like to introduce Rick Eddy. Wave your hand. He's on the board. Rick Selinski, who I'm sure a lot of you, or probably most of you, have heard on the telephone. And uh, Herb Miller. WMA is about two years old uh, and was formed as a direct result of our experience with the Department of Fish and Game, now the Department of Wildlife. Um, and their subsequent environmental impact report. I did a couple of presentations and found out that, yeah, you can be eloquent, you can have all the science you want, and it really makes a minimal impact uh, when a bureaucratic decision has been, uh, been made, which is unfortunate. We also realized uh, that there were really no, no one specific voice for the prospectors and small professional miners in the state. And as I'm sure all of you are very aware, we're extremely independent. Uh, people and uh, it's, it's great to see this many of you here tonight uh, together for a common cause. We are an advocacy organization. We're not a club. We don't teach how to gold mine or take pan like the GPAA or all the other organizations. What we've tried to do uh, over the time we've been in existence is represent your voice uh, to the legislature, um, some media exposure, but we are a young organization, so it's taken, taken time, and all of us are volunteers. We don't get paid for this. Uh, and we put in a lot of hours. So if any of you are interested in helping out, and I'll probably say this a couple, three times tonight, very much would appreciate your time and your talents. Even something as simple as a story about your mining experiences or your dad's mining experiences, and don't be afraid if you've never written anything because uh, there's a couple people that are really good editors. So if you just jot down thoughts, we can work together and, and tell your story in our monthly newsletter. Um, we've also developed a database uh, for the Western states uh, using, uh, L it's called LR2000. It's a, a database that has all of the mining claims in it. And that's how we've gotten people's um, contact information, phone numbers, and, and Rick's, hey Rick, how many people have you called, do you think? When? When? For the last 18 months? Uh, somewhere around 18,000. Yeah. He spends a lot of time on the phone. He's really uh, uh, brought our organization uh, a high level of uh, exposure. Um, the, one of the things that we'd like to do, and, and I'm going to ask uh, Kirk offline tonight, uh, and that is get some more exposure in the legislature, because that's where it's really happening. And, and we, quite honestly, have gotten blindsided by a lot of the uh, organizations who are our opponents and against what we do uh, because of their longevity. Most of them are older than we are by you know 10 years, but they also have a lot of contacts within um, the state assembly and the state senate. So it's a it's a tough nut to crack, but we think we can do it. Um, in the last year or so, we've worked with uh, Public Lands for the People, Jerry Hobbs, and. What we have done is the cases that were held, and I won't go into the, all of the names and the details, but they were all, the venue was Alameda County. Well, there's not a single mining claim in Alameda County. Um, we had all of those cases consolidated. They're being heard in San Bernardino County, and there are a lot of mining claims in San Bernardino County. We've actually had um, 30 to 50 miners show up uh, when the judge holds a hearing. Uh, which has really been impressive. Um, and we think we have a Judge uh, Ochoa who's uh, somewhat more sympathetic to our cause than um, the judge in Alameda. So today was uh, David Young and Jerry Hobbs, I think, put in the deadline for the amendments. And you don't have to, all the details. But we do have, through July, um, a calendar for all the things that we have to do. Uh, just. As an FYI, uh, your donations, we've given over $10,000 uh, to PLP in the last six months or so. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really been helpful, and, and I'm sure uh, PLP and, and the, the lawyers, uh, WMA is actually uh, the plaintiff against uh, 
DFG and in these uh, lawsuits. One of the things that we found out is that his, historically in the legal arena, uh, we've been successful but not as successful as we'd like to be because we've basically approached uh, all of these cases through mining law. And where we've gotten outmaneuvered and outthought um, is because a lot of this is CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, it's, it's about 30 years old now, I think it was 1973 or 72. Uh, Eric McSimmick, who's the executive director uh, and lives in Florida, has read, I think, over 200 of those cases. Um, and it's guaranteed uh, by the first paragraph you'll be asleep if you start to read them. Um, they're all written in legalese, of course, but I think he's up to the year 2002 uh, and we'll wade through all of them. But we're going to try to take a different tact uh, with our legal battles uh, because he wrote a really nice six-page summary of the history starting from the 1994 uh, Fish and Game uh, uh, dredging regulations through all of the lawsuits and, and really if you if what he's understood and summarized we've got a really strong case um, against the state so and if the injunction isn't granted and what we're going to be doing is trying to get back in the water uh, for those of you who are suction dredgers uh, this summer if that doesn't happen, uh, the court case will probably be uh, in the first several months of 2014. Um, the wheels of justice turn very slowly, and it's frustrating, but that's the reality. Uh, some of you are probably aware of that uh, what happens in California, sort of the bellwether state, happens everywhere. Well, it's happened in Oregon over the last three or four months. There's three bills that were passed. Uh, basically declaring all of the rivers that have gold in them as scenic waterways, meaning that if you're going to do anything within a quarter of a mile of the bank of that river, you have to have permission, including painting your fence. It's that severe. Um, the mining districts up in Oregon and four or five really active people have, uh, they had a rally with, Rick, how many people were up in Oregon for the rally? A couple hundred? I, I have no idea. Yeah, a lot, a lot. So they're getting politically active, um, and it's it's really frustrating uh, because a lot of these things are written and we don't even know about them. Um, matter of fact, the latest bill that uh, extended the moratorium indefinitely was done late at night as a trailer bill. Well, in the state legislature, a trailer bill is anything that has over one thousand dollars associated with it. So if you want to paint uh, a crosswalk in the capital. It's going to cost you more than a thousand dollars, and that's a trailer bill. And the trailer bills can be amended by anybody in the legislature. So it's a really good way for those people that are well connected to get their uh, laws and intents in place, uh, unbeknownst to the people that they affect. It's pretty insidious, but it's the reality again. Um, the Western Caucus, for those of you who don't know, is actually a group of uh, senators and representatives that have land rights and mining rights and logging rights uh, interests that meet. Eric McSimmick uh, last February, uh, excuse me, last Friday on the 8th presented for 10 minutes, but more importantly, uh, he met with 10 groups of staffers from the various members of the committee. Um, and he was actually sitting, I think, not next to, but one seat away was uh, John Banner's chief of staff. So that was very well attended, and, and what we tried to do is we did a, a two-page executive summary, and the points that were covered were defending the 1872 mining law, because they're trying to change it. The selenium and mercury issue is going to be really critical, because what's happened over the last 15 years, mercury has become the big boogeyman. Um, and Eric asked all the staffers at that meeting, how many of you have heard that mercury is a toxin? And if you eat fish, you get poisoned. And of course, everybody raises their hand. And then he asked the second question. And the second question was, how many people have been poisoned by mercury eating fish or any other organic source? And how many have had neurological damage? And according to uh, Center for Disease Control, you know what the answer is? None. Exactly. Zero. In California had a report too a few years ago. Same thing. Nobody. Well, the interesting thing is that selenium, which is another uh, mineral, acts against mercury, and it's an antagonist, is what it's called formally. 
And so even though you are ingesting methylmercury, it doesn't have any biological effect because you're protected by selenium. And selenium in California is in all the waterways. It's just a natural fact of erosion and minerals being suspended in the water column. Um, what we're going to do is work with uh, NOAA, uh, National uh, Oceanic and Administ uh, Atmospheric Administration. Uh, mm -hmm. They've done studies that actually have outlined the selenium and mercury issue. And so what we need to do is get the representatives and the senators, and more importantly their staffs, aware of this issue and get funding to, to bring it to the front so that we can counter the, you know, the 15 years of, I'll be blunt, propaganda about how toxic mercury is. Because it really has been used uh, against everybody. Coal, the coal mining industry, anytime you disturb a waterway, um, you know, big boogeyman of mercury that pops its head up. The other thing that uh, I think Kirk will probably talk about tonight is uh, Equal Access to Justice Act. Basically, those are federal dollars that if you are a organization that goes to court, uh, you can get uh, reimbursed for your legal expenses through our tax dollars. And we need to figure out a mechanism to use that or else get it overturned. Uh, and then the other, the other issue that we brought up at the uh, presentation of the Western Caucus was uh, challenge state laws that run counter to federal law. So it's a big effort that we're trying to do, but we're trying to do it in a way that's never been done before, and that is involve our federal, federal uh, legislators working with the state to change things, and, it, and more importantly, is to change people's minds. But that said, um, you know, we do have hats and shirts tonight. Please, uh, if you're in a position financially to help us out, um, get a hat or, um, and a patch, or we've got some bumper stickers. Um, but we really do need to raise some serious money. And to your point, um, bullet number four, we have already established a nonprofit. It's called the Pacific Crest Alliance. Uh, the WMA is actually an LLC, an liability corporation, which means we can give money to legislators, uh, legislators to influence them, if we had any money, that is. But the um, PCA is going to be <coughs> submitting grant proposals using miners to, to do all kinds of studies. We've got four or five really good ideas. Um, we actually invited a PhD, uh, he's probably the selenium mercury expert, uh, Nick, Dr. Nick Ralston. He was going to be there with Eric at the Western Caucus meeting, but uh, they had that little mini snowstorm in D.C., so his flight got canceled. But he definitely is going to be involved with us, uh, and that brings a lot of academic uh, legitimacy, if you will, uh, to what we're trying to do. So we want to put on the suit and tie and go into the, the <coughs> all of the legislators' offices, introduce who we are. We're going to put a press kit together, an informational package, and I'm going to try to do that you know, in the next half a year or so. Um, I did attend a after meeting event at uh, PJ Chang's Wednesday before last with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. The Sierra Nevada Conservancy represents 22 Sierra counties. Uh, on their board are six county supervisors. So they put units together, three to four counties. So the county supervisors are on there. They are a state organization, ostensibly with the purpose to coordinate the, with the people who live in the Sierra, projects of, and how they're going to affect those people. Yes? Oh, you're just waving? Okay, here. Um, what we're going to do in September is they've got a, a great Sierra River cleanup uh, project, and we, I've already talked to uh, one of the administrative assistants. We're going to try to get uh, groups of miners to clean up the rivers, but what we're going to do is use dredges and the hookah things so we can dive in the deep holes. And if you look at, you get a chance on that wall, that was taken out, Rick, what, one, one summer, one crew? One season. One season. One and that was the South Fork of the America. Yeah, one area. Yeah, one, one small area, you know, a few hundred yards of a river. I actually sent those pictures to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, <coughs> and they basically said, wow, uh, that's a lot of uh, lead and toxic material and sunglasses and shoes and beer cans and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I think if we can, as an organization, get tied in with groups like the Sierra Nevada Council, it's basically to our advantage. Because they're going to see us as part of the solution, not part of the problem. 
Um, but again, it's a slow process. Uh, I just started it in the last three or four weeks. Uh, I will be going up and talking to uh, their executive director. Their office is in uh, Auburn. They were granted by the state. They, they formed, I think, in 2004 or five, uh, and they were funded to the tune of $65 million. And to your point, they have grant money. Yeah, so that's, that's gonna be another group. Yes? Well, I just wanna say one thing about the conservancy. Every contact with them when you're referring to uh, what we're trying to accomplish, but the key phrase for the Sierra Nevada Conservancy is working landscapes. And, and, and not just the wild and scenic protected forever, but, but to actually create landscapes that function in the local economy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's just a term that is part of their uh, charter uh, that needs to be used a lot. Okay, thanks. I, I also found out when I was there is that you're not a concerned citizen, because I didn't tell them who I was, because I didn't know how I was going to be received when I first went there. They said, no, no, it's not concerns, it's interested citizen. It's another buzzword. So I, just, I guess there's less emotional baggage with if you're interested versus concerned. But anyway, yeah, to your point, that's great, and I'll keep that in mind. Um, but if we, I think if we increase our presence in these, these groups and organizations, um, it's really to our advantage. Uh, and that's how you find out things. Uh, when I was there, uh, anecdotally, Izzy Martin, who was the executive director for the Sierra Fund, and I'm sure some of you know her, was there. Uh, she actually was instrumental in getting the legislator, legislators to pass um, the bill that that created the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and funded it to 65, like I said, the tune of $65 million grant money. The other thing we'd like to do is that I, you know, I realize everybody's got other interests and, and not a lot of time, is we as a nonprofit, when we get funded, can actually hire people to do things and pay people, not just depend on volunteer things. And I think this is really critical because, you know, it, it would be nice, uh, to even get reimbursed gas money if you're going to travel somewhere. But if we had, for example, a grant set up that where we were doing, we needed to set up dredges, those, those miners who had the dredges working would get paid as consultants. So there's a lot of things that we can do and, and, and make it economically uh, in our favor. Because there's basically billions of dollars of, of grant money floating around. <clears throat> So this is sort of a joke, but uh, it must have been a huge dredge moving all that water. This was the storm last uh, fall on the South Fork of the Yuba. Think, hey, Herb, did you take this picture? Is that yours? Okay. But that's a lot of water. And you know, one of the things when you talk to people that what the suction dredgers do and what a you know, hard rock miner does, somebody who's running a high banker, they have no sense of scale. Um, talk to people about a dredge and oh yeah it's three stories tall it's 100 feet long and it goes up the river and chews it all up and they have they really don't know what little impact suction dredging has on, on a river and I got interviewed a couple years ago for uh, an article uh, out of the Bay Area and I said you know there's no such a proportion because there were 3,500 dredge permits in 2009 and that flood probably moved 10 times the amount of material that those 3,500 dredgers did in you know, multiple seasons. That was half of 97 because the water was over the top of that bridge in 97. Yeah. Yeah. And then the big flood in 86 was the